Together, we're building something right here in our backyard on the south side of Chicago. And with your help, in your community too. We're building a team, local, national, and global, with the Obama Presidential Center as our home field. A team unlike any other. Ours is focused not on taking sides, but solving problems. A team that anyone in the world can join. A diverse group, united in a common passion for the most important role in a democracy. The role of citizen. In our hometown and yours, we'll inspire and empower people to change their world. My name is Michael Reynolds. I'm a retired union carpenter and volunteer at Sweetwater every day and have been for a couple years now. The Sweetwater Foundation is a place where the community come together. Our youngsters learn agriculture and carpentry. They learn other trades, electrical, plumbing. It feels fantastic to see young people embracing building things, learning things, planting different vegetables and fruits, just to see the enthusiasm in their eyes. A lot of the news media that we get about our young people and our communities is focused on the negative. When you come to a place like Sweetwater, you see that that's not the totality of our young people, of our communities. Our young people only need someone to embrace them and let them know their capabilities. And this is what Sweetwater does. It encourages that growth in self. I've grown tremendously as a person that's been involved with Sweetwater. My name is Delfine Erasusta, and I founded the Local Innovation Networks, an NGO that works to improve management capacities of local governments. I started by myself, now we have 35 people working, of which 30 are women. <laughs> I don't know if you know Argentina, but it's really big. We have 2,200 local governments all through the country. For me, it was amazing to discover that many mayors wanted to, to be helped. And for me, it's very inspiring when I see a local government official or a mayor making decisions different uh, because of all the tools and resources we give them and with all the tools and resources they share with each other. We are all a generation that wants to work with each other, so I'm really excited to finding others that also are trying to change the world <laughs> and to meet them in the Obama Summit this October. My name is Trisha Shetty. I started an organization called She Says with the aim to educate, rehabilitate, and empower women and society at large to take direct action against sexual abuse. You're either a passive watcher, you're either perpetuating it, or you're actively doing something to end the cycle. So this is where we as a community need to come together and say that no more will we tolerate this society where women are being sexually abused and we will be silent bystanders. So community intervention is of utmost importance. What we are trying to do is build a sustained movement that will ensure that we really can have a gender equal society, not 10 years from now, not five years from now, but today. I won't stop. In fact, I will be right there with you as a citizen for all my remaining days. The South Side is where I first landed when I moved to Chicago. We had this community that had so much history. The people there, universities, businesses. It's home. I consider myself a South Sider. This is where I learned that change only happens when ordinary people get engaged. With the foundation on the South Side of Chicago, we'll be able to give something back home after this incredible journey. The single most important thing I can do is to help prepare the next generation of leadership to take their own track of change in the world. More than a library or a museum, it will be a living, working center for citizenship. We'll have projects all over the city, the country, and the world. Our work has inspired so many young people out there to believe that you can make a difference, to hitch your wagon to something bigger than yourself. My name is Brian Gunawan, and I'm from Jakarta, Indonesia. I'm the founder of OTP Foundation. OTP stands for On That Point. And On That Point is a jargon commonly used in parliamentary debating to request interruption when somebody else is speaking. Now, if you freeze that moment, it is the balance of speaking and listening. It is the kind of responsible freedom of expression that OTP Foundation strives for. 
Autope Foundation works with disadvantaged communities in rural areas. We've actually educated over 10,000 individuals, ranging from the age of six to 60 year old even. So the idea is that whenever leadership position is assumed by these people, then they would be able to actually create better expressions of their own thoughts. We're equipping them with tools such as like structured thinking or how do you look at different angles over a certain issue or like how to articulate your thoughts better. When I see the smile from those participants, I'm constantly reminded why I'm doing this. And that is just an amazing feeling in the world. It's pre bare I have my notebook. My name is Rashita Taneja. I'm from Delhi and I'm a Bangalore-based webcomic artist. I'm the creator of the webcomic Sanitary Panels. My notebook and uh, my pens and I can make it anywhere. Sanitary Panels is a feminist webcomic that comments on uh, culture, society and politics. Some of my most viral comics have reached uh, millions and millions of people and I think it feels like a responsibility that I, I need to put out content that is accurate, that is fair and that is also something that contributes to social justice through content that's viral and shareable and relatable. Initially when I started I had zero artistic talent. I used to doodle a lot and uh, the easiest way for me to communicate effectively through a comic would be through stick figures. I'm, I'm learning to draw now, but I still like this style because of its simplicity. So a lot of people have asked me why I named my comic Sanitary Panels and I wanted it to be something representative of what my comic stands for, which is to break taboos. And I wanted it to be confrontational, basically. With Sanitary Panels, I want to leave people thinking that it's all right for them to speak their mind because that's what I'm doing through my work as well. So my name is Paul Green and I created the Appalachian Technology Initiative. We were talking about well, what could K-12 education do to become an economic driver in our local communities. And we knew that STEM fields. Those are the jobs of the future. We also knew that based on the data that our school systems really weren't creating pipelines and pathways for our students in these fields. So the ATI came about as a way to create opportunity for kids. Depending on what year you look at the metrics, we are always either the first or second poorest in the United States Congressional District. And we want to make sure that our kids in Eastern Kentucky have opportunities just like every kid in, in the world. We're hearing you know, all types of stories of kids now that are going into fields of computer science or uh, aviation, aerospace related fields because of this initiative that probably two or three years ago would never even thought about that. And, and all we need is just that little spark to, you know, we can do this, and then once you give them that spark, then we have kids all over the place. I mean, they just take off. My name is Sheldon Smith, and I am the founder of the Dovetail Project that works with young African-American fathers between the ages of 17 to 24 here in Chicago. Oftentimes, you don't hear about the good things that are occurring on the South Side, so my inspiration really comes from being overlooked the impact that you know that I'm looking for us to have is is really fulfilling the missing gaps that you know that the fathers are struggling with overall just giving them the space that they need to be successful fathers when I run into alumni and I see them with their children it's it's an awesome feeling and it and it gives me that extra passion that I need because oftentimes as leaders it's tough to get that fuel that you need to keep you out here in the fight. It's really about you know building one family at a time. Watching the young men go through the program and watching us make impact on their lives, it, it always let me know and confirm that the work that we're doing is, is the right work. My name is Marietje Schaken. I serve in the European Parliament where I represent people from the Netherlands and I'm from Amsterdam. One of the key questions that I deal with is how to make sure the rule of law remains meaningful in a hyper-connected world. And so what I did with a number of colleagues is establish the Digital Agenda Intergroup, which is a cross-party, cross-nationality group of members of the European Parliament. And together we want to make the most relevant, most future-proof rules to deal with the digital agenda for Europe. And so for myself, it's great to tap in to what people are doing themselves and to learn from them, from their creativity, from their solutions. And what I hope from the summit is that I can see how people have a 21st century interpretation of what civic duty, civic participation is. And especially when it comes to representative democracy that I care deeply about. I think we need to find new ways to engage 
and new ways to build trust. Harvey is coming. Saturday, the storm hits. Monday, I'm trapped. Tuesday, I'm trapped. Wednesday, I'm trapped. So Friday morning, I go volunteer with a friend and we get the idea that there's more that we can be doing. We find a space, open our doors the next morning to something that we called the Giving Hub. My name is Amy Woodall and I'm from Houston, Texas. I'm the founder of the Black Sheep Agency. So we go from two female entrepreneurs running creative businesses to distribution hub managers. People showed up, more than 400 volunteers moved during that 21 days, over 100,000 goods. What I witnessed during the storm was something that I wish we could see in each other all the time just jump in to solve problems together without a storm as the catalyst. Imagine what we could accomplish together. My name is Emily May. I'm the co-founder and executive director of Hollaback, a movement to end all forms of harassment that started right here in Brooklyn and now is in over 50 cities, in over 30 countries, in over 15 languages around the world. Harassment is such an isolating experience and we wanted to show people that there were other people out there who were going through what they were going through and that we had their back. As part of our work, we have just launched a collaboration called The People Supper, designed to get people to sit down with one another across political views, across identities, and to fully see and hear one another, to hear each other's stories, to believe and, and to see each other's humanity. Through community, through our ability to take care of one another, I think that we can make people feel whole. My name is Jamal Cole, and I live in the Chatham community. When you think of Chatham, you think of community groups, you think of activism, you think manicured lawns, brick bungalows, you think African-American home ownership. I love Chatham. While volunteering in the Cook County Jail and talking with the teenagers there, I realized that none of the teenagers I volunteered with had ever been downtown. They had never seen the lake. They had never waved for a taxi. They had never been inside of a glass building downtown. Their whole worldview is different. They order their food every day through three-inch bulletproof glass windows. That reality is tragic. If we're gonna be serious about all teenagers having a fair shot at leading a productive life, that inequality has to be corrected. So I started an organization, it's called My Block, My Hood, My City. We take teenagers from these under-resourced communities on educational field trips, and we expose them to different cultures, different professions, and different cuisines. The number one issue right now in Chicago is violence. I believe exposure is a key solution to solving violence. By exposing teenagers to more opportunities, they don't have to choose violence. If they're exposed to more things and exposed to opportunities, they have a solid foundation of things to choose from so they won't choose violence. If you show somebody better, they're gonna do better. If they don't know no better, not gonna do better. Community involvement is everything if you wanna create change. It's everything. My family brought me to Chicago in 1919, hoping for more opportunities and had anticipations that change was going to come. I have this huge belief that Chicago is our great city. And I think that our means that all of us share in its greatness. You can start something here. You can meet everyone in your community. You can start small and grow big. I mean, this is, this is it. This is where I'm truly making a home, building a business, and wanting to see it grow. I want to just do more for the community. I want to do more for the city.
name is Anshul Tiwari and I'm the founder of Youth Ki Awaaz. Young people in India grow up in a culture of silence where they are often told not to question the norms, they are told not to break stereotypes or work on issues that they are passionate for. A youth Ki Awaaz wants to break that culture of silence and is here to solve that problem. Anybody can publish on Youth Ki Awaaz. Once you publish a story, our team of editors goes through it to make sure it meets all the facts. Um, it's high quality, it really talks about an issue that we want to talk about, it meets our community guidelines. And if it does all of that, it goes to our homepage and then gets shared on our social media so it can get amplified. So Youth Ki Awaaz has had several impact stories over the last couple of years. We've seen a lot of power in the, in the form of storytelling that comes on the platform. It gets picked up by international media organizations and gets covered widely across the world. You know, citizen voices have been left out of the mainstream media discourse and what that's done is it's really made sure that the day-to-day -day issues that people face do not get highlighted and that's what we do. You know, what really makes me come to work every morning is the fact that there are young people who were previously marginalized and found a voice in a platform like YK. Uh, there are people who are actively talking about issues that are affecting them. And there is a feeling that if we all come together and speak up, something really can change and something really will change. It is an absolute honor to be here at the Obama Foundation Town Hall in New Delhi alongside hundreds of change makers from all across the country and to introduce President Obama. It isn't an easy task, you see. There's not much that you don't already know about President Obama. But let me just remind you of something he once said that fits this gathering really well. Change will not come if we wait for some other person or some other time. We're the ones we've been waiting for. We're the change that we seek. I was born in a generation that saw the onset of the internet, the open democratic space that has shaped us and our society in more ways than we can think. As a 14 year old, when I was first introduced to the idea of this space by my elder brother, my life changed. It instantly gave me a voice that I never thought I had. So when at 17, I realized that hundreds of millions of people in the world do not have an equal shot at speaking up, the internet became my platform. And I embarked on a journey with Youth Ki Awaaz that would change my life and that of thousands of others. In my journey, I have seen thousands of big and small acts of speaking up by young people that have shaped the way our generation handles some of the toughest issues that we are facing, be it menstrual taboos or violence against women, or discrimination based on caste, class, and sexual orientation. And all this because of the idealism and hope that my generation represents. And while this is only the tip of the iceberg, a bigger battle is yet to be won. A battle against the forces that seek to divide us. A battle to ensure that everyone, regardless of their caste, class, sexuality, or background, have an equal shot at speaking up and reshaping narratives which have for far too long marginalized them. A battle to see a world where empathy, equality, and justice are the key words that represent our generation, and where speaking up and hearing each other out is the norm. And I ask upon all of you to represent this idea. This act requires courage. And while it may sound small, it is these small things that make a difference. As Buddhist philosopher, Dr. Daisaku Ikeda once said, what may look like a small act of courage is courage nevertheless. The important thing is to be willing to take the step forward. I continue being extremely inspired by how President Barack Obama not only represented this idea of speaking up, but continues to encourage it, especially from those who disagreed with him. It is my most humble pleasure to introduce you to the man who we have all come to respect and admire. For some of us, he's represented the onset of a more equal and just United States of America. And for most of us, he's represented hope. Hope that every single person, regardless of their differences and background, can change the world. 
Please join me in, in welcoming President Barack Obama. Hello, everybody. Well, thank you so much. Please, please have a seat. Uh, let me just first say that I was backstage uh, before Anshul came out, and uh, I've never heard such a quiet, <laughs> orderly group. Uh, so uh, hopefully, now that we're kind of warmed up, uh, people will be uh, not feeling so obliged to uh, uh, be so formal. <laughs> you, you, yeah, there you go. <laughs> so uh, let, let me see if I can get this right. Uh, Bahut, Danyavad, oh, is that right? Okay. And I, uh, I want to welcome you to the first of many Obama Foundation town halls that we're going to be planning around the world. Uh, hello to everybody who is watching on Obama.org. Uh, it is wonderful to be back in India and back in Delhi. Uh, almost three years ago, I had the tremendous honor of being the first American president to join for Republic Day. Um, it was, I will say my most vivid memory was uh, those acrobats on the motorcycles. <laughs> those guys were amazing. Uh, a little over seven years ago, my first stop on a visit to Asia uh, was here, and I had a privilege to address your parliament. In 2009, I recognized India at the White House with my first uh, state dinner, uh, and we danced uh, some bhangra. And, uh, you know, we have had uh, Diwali celebrations in the White House every year that I was there. Uh, and all of this is because, as I said in a speech that I gave this morning, uh, India and the United States have so much in common. The U.S. is home, of course, to millions of Indian Americans, uh, and their proud heritage uh, is, at the same time, uh, combined with an incredible contribution that they make in every field in the United States. Both of our countries are hugely diverse, and we've got different languages and different backgrounds and different ethnicities and different faiths. But uh, what we also uh, have in common is a, a set of values that we believe in deeply. And I believe that the partnership between uh, the world's oldest democracy and the world's largest democracy could be a defining partnership of the 21st century. Now, I also believe that charting the course for that better future is going to depend on all of you. It's going to depend on young people. Uh, there are all, sort of, all sorts of things that I care about, all sorts of specific issues that I'm going to continue to work on, and I plan to lend my voice to, uh, to focus the rest of my career on. Uh, I'll be out there advocating on behalf of doing something about climate change and doing something about inequality and making sure that uh, you know, women are getting the same opportunities as men and fighting against, <laughs> there you go, and, 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 and fighting against the forces of discrimination and uh, tribalism and racism. But the single most important thing that I want to focus on is lifting up and identifying and working with and training the next generation of leadership, not just in the United States, but all around the world. Uh, and that's really the central goal of our foundation. It's going to be based in Chicago, my hometown, but we want to have projects, programs, partnerships, and digital networks everywhere. And I'm not just lending my name to the foundation, I'm going to be an active part of it. Uh, this year I've already met with young people like yourselves in Germany, in Indonesia, in Brazil, uh, and then we had our first ever Obama Foundation Summit in Chicago. And I don't want to speak uh, too long because I want to spend most of our time on questions, uh, and Anshul is going to help to moderate it. But I did want to mention the reason I thought it was so important to do something in India. Uh, you've got the largest population of young people in the world, uh, and that's a lot, so we might as well start big. 
Um, we've already identified some remarkable young leaders who are doing extraordinary things here in India. Uh, authors, athletes, artists, entrepreneurs, civic leaders from all across the country. We've got activists who are working on everything from education to gender equality to climate change. Uh, a couple of young leaders were re recently with us in Chicago, and I just want to acknowledge them. Uh, Trisha Shetty started, where's, where is she? There she is. Did you have fun in Chicago? Oh, see there, she, now, I didn't call on her to say that, but thank you. But Trisha uh, started an organization called She Says, aimed at educating and empowering men and women to take action against sexual abuse. Uh, also joining us in Chicago was uh, Sanchana Krishnan, uh, who works with communities to destigmatize mental health issues through the power of personal storytelling. Where's, uh, is, there you are, there you are. Uh, and here in India, we've got young leaders like uh, Kuldeep uh, Dantewadia, who's building, where, where's uh, Kuldeep? There he is. He's building this country's first, what he calls, solve squad of 17,500 young people so far who are driving change at the local level all across India. So the point is, the point is, is that the, these young people are already showing the power that anybody has if they take the initiative and have the courage, as Anshul said, to drive change, to make a difference. And there have never been more powerful, more accessible tools for each of you to make a difference than there are today. Uh, and in fact, I, I would argue, and I mentioned this in my speech earlier this morning, there's never been a better time to be a young person. I mean, it's always good being young, by the way. <laughs> but uh, if you think about it, if you had to choose a moment in history in which you could be born, and you didn't know ahead of time who you were going to be. You didn't know what your status would be. You didn't know whether you were going to be male, female, Indian, or American. You didn't know whether you were going to be uh, gay, straight. You didn't know whether you, you were going to be rich or poor, what caste you might be a member of, what religion. So you, you're just a human. And you had to choose when to be born. You choose now. Because as, as troubled as our politics are, as, as difficult as the world can, can seem when you're watching uh, the newscasts, the fact is that over the past hundred years, we've come from a world where only a small fraction of women could vote to a world where almost every woman can. Since 1950, the global average life expectancy has grown by more than 20 years. Since 1990, I mean, that's not that long ago. I, I, was, I was in law school in 1990. We've cut extreme poverty and childhood mortality in half. Much of that, by the way, in India and China. Since 2000, we've evolved from a world without marriage equality to one in which it's a reality in more than two dozen countries. The fact is the world has never been healthier. It has never been wealthier. And despite terrible conflicts that are still taking place around the world and, and in, in, um, remarkable cruelty and suffering, um, the world is actually less violent and more tolerant than it's ever been. Fewer people are dying young. More people are living not only longer but better. More girls are attending school. More adults can read. More children have the vaccines that they need. And, and the point is, is that none of this happened just because of luck. It happened because people chose to make it happen. And many of those people, working over the course of many years, uh, started without power or wealth or title. And many of them were extraordinarily young, just like you. I, I always have to remind people that when you think of somebody like Dr. Martin Luther King, who, who did so much in our country, he was 24, 25 years old when he began uh, as an activist in Montgomery, 
Alabama to try to desegregate uh, the South. And he started in small steps, and it was only a few years later where he won the Nobel Prize and would help to revolutionize America. But it wasn't just Dr. King, it was all these young people around him who were just like us. You know, they had their flaws, they had their problems, they had their doubts, but despite all those imperfections, they pressed forward anyway, often far from the limelight, with determination and with faith in the future, because they believed that their efforts would matter and that they, they would be part of this upward trajectory uh, in our human story. So that's, that's the legacy that is available to you should you choose to grab it. That should inspire each of you to keep pushing for progress in whatever field you're in and whatever communities that you live in, knowing that your efforts matter. Uh, and I hope uh, that all of you stay engaged after this session uh, and, and uh, are prepared to, to work with each other and work with us um, and let other young leaders know about uh, how we can continue to build up a community of change around the world. Uh, and that way, uh, next time I come back to India, uh, you guys will be here waiting for me and you can tell me all the amazing progress that you've already made. All right? Okay. So enough talk. Let's, uh, we're going to get Ancho back out here. Here he is. I said, by the way, that uh, I thought he was the sharpest dresser of any introducer that I've had. <laughs> I think that's a, that's a good outfit. Um, I can't get away with it. <laughs> It's a little too hip for me. But we're going to sit here. We're going to use these mics. Yeah. Okay. All right. and, and sometimes I may stand up just because I've been sitting a lot and I'm going to have a long flight to Paris right after this. So uh, don't mind me. Uh, should I start? Or yeah. OK. So uh, there aren't any big ground rules on this. This is just a conversation. Uh, the only rules are that uh, if I call on you, you have to stand up if you can and introduce yourself so that people know who you are. Um, tell us a little bit, but not too long, <laughs> about what you're doing. And uh, the only other rule is we're going to go uh, boy, girl, boy, girl, because sometimes men talk too much. <laughs> so that way, that way we, can, we can assure ourselves that uh, there's parity and equality, because we have to model the kind of world that we want. All right, we're going to start with you, because you had your hand up first. And we've got microphones so that uh, uh, everybody else can hear you. Go ahead. Good afternoon, sir. And yes. thank you for giving us a beautiful opportunity to come and speak to you about what we are doing in our field work and how we can contribute to your vision of a global community. Right. Sir, my name is Preeti Khanna. I'm mm -hmm. a Delhi University student. I'm a PhD scholar, and I'm currently working on nutrition and mental health of adolescents. Uh -huh. So my question to you is, sir, that what is your vision of a global health community, and how can we as young leaders contribute towards it? Well, that's, thank a, you. that's a great question, and, and I suspect you know more of the answers than I do. Uh, but I'll, I'll go ahead and, and uh, offer a, a, a general view on, on what I've learned during the course of my presidency. Um, the first point is that if you have a healthy community, particularly starting with healthy children, that's going to be one of the greatest indicators of overall development for a country. So. Uh, it is not only good for the individual uh, that there's a public health infrastructure that is promoting uh, people's well-being, but it's also good economic policy. And what I've learned is that it starts with young people because young people are naturally healthy if people don't screw them up. <laughs> um, and the uh, and the more that you can emphasize prevention, the better off you're going to be. Um, you know, if, you, if you think about advanced economies, some of the progress that has been made has to do with the marvels of technology and science. Uh, and 
you know, thankfully, because of things like vaccines and uh, other discoveries, we can cure diseases that in the past we could not cure. Uh, but probably the single biggest contributor, for example, to uh, the health and longevity of people in more advanced countries was things, were things like clean drinking water and proper ways of eliminating waste and, and, and sewage systems. Uh, because what those things did was prevent diseases from taking root in the first place. So um, obviously there are going to be differences in the communities, uh, and even within countries, much less between countries. Uh, I don't claim to be an expert on what are some of the most important public health issues in India, but I think it's fair to say that we, we, we can anticipate that uh, basic prenatal care for mothers, that's a universal investment that when you make pays huge dividends. Uh, children's brains develop in the womb and then in the earliest stages of life, and if you've made that investment early, then typically they're going to do much better. Having the sorts of infrastructure or, uh, that I described around clean drinking water, and since we're in Delhi, I have to mention clean air. Uh, that, I think, is a big and important investment. Um, basic things like vaccinations uh, uh, to, to prevent uh, diseases that in many parts of the world have already been entirely cured. Those are cheap, modest efforts that, uh, th that we can provide. Um, and then, I, I think, nutrition. And, and just making sure that not only do people have enough to eat, but that they, they have enough variety in their diets. Uh, and, and the interesting thing when it comes to nutrition is that uh, for developing countries, my hope would be that they uh, leapfrog some of the bad habits that have developed in advanced countries around processed foods and take advantage of uh, locally grown, more natural products, which actually can then benefit farmers and uh, provide uh, an economic base uh, that is less concentrated than the highly processed uh, foods that uh, you know, have taken root in, in, in many economies that result in the United States, for example, with huge uh, increases in obesity and, and all the consequent health problems there. So, um, so you've got a lot of work to do and a lot of, uh, uh, a lot of people to, to help, and I'm sure you're going to do a great job. Uh, I'm going to return to a theme that I already mentioned earlier, though, and that is because it's so important to start with children, that means that you have to make sure that the mothers are getting the support that they need, including, by the way, educating mothers, because if, if mothers are empowered and have an education and have some economic base of their own, typically their children are going to do better as well. Okay? Good. Thank you. Thanks for the great question. Okay. No standing up, though. That's not going to be a strategy. <laughs> the, uh, I'm, I'm teasing you, but, the, uh, but it's true. Uh, <laughs> yeah, the yelling thing won't work yet. Gentleman in the blue shirt right there. Oh, I'm sorry. I guess there were a bunch of blue shirts. I'm going to so. go ahead. <laughs> a question anyways. Um, so first of all, Mr. Obama, thank you so much for being here. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, a lot taller than I thought you'd be. <laughs> you know, it's interesting. Uh, people always say that. I don't know why <laughs> folks thought I was short. My sis you know, but, but my theory is, is because Michelle is tall, people don't, you know, they kind of think, oh, well, they, don't, they don't realize how tall she is, so they think, he anyway, yeah, I'm a tall guy. <laughs> sure. All right, go ahead. All right. So my, my name is Uday Keith. I am a data science instructor at, in Bangalore. We teach uh -huh. out of Academy. So we teach data sciences and also blockchain development. So when the Obama Foundation or any organization has the goal of training our youth, yeah. I want to understand from your point of view, where does technology fit into that aspect or that process? Uh -huh. it's, it's a great question. Um, and 
you know, I think that, first of all, I, I was mentioning earlier today, I think that technology is this incredible potential force for good, uh, but it also has problems and limits, and we have to understand uh, how we can best use it for good, but also avoid some of the traps of technology. When it comes to uh, training young people, the, the obvious advantage of technology is you can just leverage and reach more people uh, very quickly. So when I started my campaign in 2008, we were one of the earliest adapters of social media. And we weren't favored in my election, but the big advantage I had was I had a lot of enthusiastic volunteers and supporters all across the country. It would have been impossible for us to directly coordinate with all of them without building a, some huge staff and bureaucracy and infrastructure. The fact that we had uh, social media early, uh, available fairly early, not, by the way, because I was so brilliant, but because I had a bunch of young people who said, why don't we try this thing? Um, and we were using MySpace back then. I mean, like, <laughs> you know, Facebook didn't exist, and, and uh, uh, Twitter, I don't think, did either at that point. Um, that's how old I am. <laughs> but, th but what it meant was we could just send out Information, you know, if, if we had somebody in a fairly remote area who wanted to start uh, being part of our campaign, we could just transmit information to them directly, tell them, here's Obama's stance on all the issues, here's how you should approach organizing your local community, and, and, and suddenly they had a tool that they could work with and they could communicate back with us. And, and so that basic principle, right, that Right now, I can reach millions of people just through uh, writing a quick note uh, on a device, uh, allows us then to, to get more information more quickly to more people, and then have them interact and get feedback. And that's wonderful. Now, um, when it comes to uh, technology and education, what we found is, and because you're a teacher, uh, I think it's, it's, uh, it's important to emphasize uh, it doesn't replace the importance of teachers. And what I've seen sometimes is people think, okay, I'm, we're going to put a computer in the classroom and then somehow magically kids are going to be better educated. No, if, if the teacher is not incorporating the technology into the social context in which children are learning, then it's not going to work. Um, so. Uh, any training, any leadership development program, if it's just relying on technology, but it's not thinking about how do you, once you have somebody online, how do you also form communities offline? You know, if, if you've given them information uh, on their devices, how are you allowing them to apply that in a social context and interacting with people? If, if you're not doing that, then it's probably going to be a failure. It's not a, it's not a, a magic uh, fix for everything. Um, and in fact, that brings me to my final point on technology, which is what we're finding now is that the dangers of technology are that um, it can actually isolate people. So, so they become so hooked to their device that they no longer have a conversation. And because of the algorithms that are often being used for people when they're searching for information, what we're discovering now is that people start uh, having their pre-existing biases constantly reinforced through the device. And they never s hear information that diverges from what they already believe. They, they, they stop listening to or interacting with people who don't agree with them. And that's not how you learn. That's not how you become a leader, is simply uh, surrounding yourself with opinions that already fit your own, right? And don't challenge you or 
force you out of your comfort zone or force you to empathize and think about other people. Um, and, and, and so what I'm really uh, trying to focus on is how do we build a, a digital network in the Obama Foundation that uh, allows people to meet, converge, share ideas, but also forces people to act offline after meeting online, forces people to have conversations outside of the internet, forces them to then meet and engage people who are not already part of uh, the, the, the converted. Um, be, because I think if, if you do that, then you have a powerful tool. If you don't do that, then uh, you will limit the amount of influence and impact uh, ultimately that you're gonna have. And, and that's not what we should be teaching uh, our kids is, is somehow just to stay in a very narrow, safe place. We want them to get out and uh, meet the world because uh, that's how they're gonna be able to grow their influence. All right, excellent question. All right, we're, now the way this is working, uh, we've got actually, speaking of technology, there are people who are watching, uh, there were a lot of people who wanted to come today. We didn't have enough seats. So as a consequence, we've got uh, a bunch of questions that are also coming online. And uh, Ancho, he, he was not just here for decoration. <laughs> he is actually going to, uh, he, he actually has questions. And, and so we're going to alternate every so often. We're going to bring in uh, some questions that came in online. Go ahead. Uh, President Obama, our first question is uh, from Instagram by Lippi Mehta. Um, and the question is actually something that a lot of us actually wonder, people especially who work on social change. Um, that change is, is, is you know, a painfully slow process mm -hmm. and it can get really demotivating at times, mm -hmm. especially for people around you who work with you. Right. So how do you continue to encourage people around you? How does one do that? That is a great question um, because you're right. Uh, change is hard. Um, I, I'll just go back to an example that I'm, I'm very familiar with from my own country. I mentioned Dr. King earlier and the movement for uh, equal rights for African Americans. Uh, what people don't really recognize is that from the time that the Supreme Court of the United States declared that separate schools for people of different races was inherently unequal, which happened in 1954, to the time when a law was actually passed that would implement that in a serious way. That was a decade. Then it took another decade or so of court fights and battles and so forth before you actually saw schools get, in a serious way, desegregated. So that's 20 years from the time you have what looks like a victory <laughs> until you're even actually seeing significant effects in society. And there are guaranteed analogous situations here in India where it, it feels like, man, we've been working for a long time and we thought we had a victory and then suddenly it seems it's not having an effect and we've got to keep on going and we're refighting battles that we thought we had already won. Uh, and if you're working at a local level, then it can be even more frustrating and discouraging because you don't have the benefit of, you know, publicity and TV cameras and a sense of a big movement. You feel isolated and alone sometimes and you're just trying to work and nobody's really persuaded that what you are trying to do is possible. Um, so, so a couple of things that I, I, I would just suggest. Uh, uh, the first is know ahead of time that change is hard so that you're setting your own expectations properly and you're not getting discouraged. Uh, point number two is to try to break up uh, your efforts into bite-sized pieces manageable pieces. You know, w one of the, the, the classic things that I used to do in, in training uh, young organizers, uh, I would say to them, uh, if, 
if your goal is eliminating uh, world hunger, you're going to get discouraged very quickly. If your goal is, here's a local community and I'm going to try to uh, help feed X number of people over the course of the next couple of years. Well, that's something that's achievable. So, so you want to make sure. It doesn't mean that you should set your sights low. It just means that you're, you're breaking up your actions and activities into something that feels achievable because then when you are mobilizing supporters and, and, and partners and others who want to work with you, you're going to uh, create victories uh, along a, a regular schedule, and that makes people feel as if what they're doing is worthwhile. Uh, the third point I would make is make sure that you're listening with the, to the people that you claim you want to help. Because I think one of, the, uh, one of the fastest ways that a lot of young people get discouraged is they have a theory in their head, and then they go into a community, and the theory bumps up against reality because they're trying to tell people this is what should be important to you, and the people say, eh, that's not what I care about, right? So you make, I mean, if you go into, in, into a, 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 a rural area in India, and you say to them, ah, you need to start working on climate change right now because the way the weather patterns are uh, shifting, the monsoon season is going to change, and there's going to be terrible droughts, and and people are going to say, "Yo, I, I need to. I'm I'm worrying right now about feeding my family." Um, and 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 so one of one of the most important principles, I think, and and this prevents you from that kind of discouragement is if you've spent time listening and finding out what it is that people themselves are concerned about, then y you will shape your efforts and your agenda in a way that people are responsive to. And you won't feel like you're just hitting your head against a brick wall. You'll feel as if you're in a conversation and working with people with uh, the energy that they naturally have. Um, that doesn't mean that it becomes easy. It just means that uh, you're in a relationship, and, and relationships with the people you're working with are really important. Then it's not an abstraction. And people, oftentimes, they'll work with you when times are hard, not because they necessarily are absolutely convinced that they're going to that you're going to succeed, but because they care about you, because you have a relationship, and and that's important. And then the final thing is is uh, uh, take time to have some fun within your work. Uh, and and I did not always follow this advice. I when I was all I did was uh, party from about <laughs> the age of about 15 to 20, and then. Something happened to me, and I became very serious. And from about the age of 20 to 27, um, I was just always serious. And you know, I was all, if I wasn't working, I was reading, and I was. I only had one plate and one towel, and because everything else was wasteful, and and uh, um, you know, my mother would come to visit me, and she'd say, "Yeah, let's go." You know, go out to dinner, and I'd say, ah, that's a waste, and, you know, that's a bourgeois, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> you know, and, and I just took myself very seriously. Um, and, and part of it was a reaction, right, because I had, uh, <laughs> I had way too much fun <laughs> for, for a while. Uh, so I, I felt like I had to overcompensate. But, but the point, though, is, is that in your work, I, I think if, if you're trying to do something good and important, sometimes you, know, you, you feel as if, all right, I have to make sacrifices and this is hard and, and I've got to you know, uh, really uh, 
tighten everything up. Uh, there can't be any loose ends. And I, but, but that's sometimes not sustainable. Right? So you have to create space, not just in your own life, but also in, your, in the organization, where sometimes you say, well, let's just do something fun. Uh, sometimes let's do something that creates joy. Uh, and, and that can be anything from uh, a dance to going to the movies to you know, surfing. Uh, did somebody say surfing? Okay, go go surf, man. <laughs> I mean, I, I I didn't know there were there were big waves in India, but that's that's cool. That's cool. Okay, all right. Um, huh? Yeah, pizza and beer. I, I think is is a, a good standard, fun thing. I'm I'm all for pizza and beer. So anyway, uh, that I've got other stuff, but I don't want to uh, I don't want to engage in a monologue here. Um, did I, it was a guy I asked first, right? All right, so guys, all put your hands down. Uh, it's a lady's turn. Uh, uh, this is always the hardest part, is choosing people. Um, uh, the young lady in the white... Uh, yes, it's beautiful. Thank you. Oh, but you need a microphone. Here it comes. Here it comes. Mr. President... I wish a great success for the Obama Foundation. I'm a transgender woman. My name is Dr. Akai Padmashali. I was a sex worker. I was a beggar. I was rejected by all the sections of society. And I am the black beauty. And I love you. Yes, yes, thank you. Okay. Mr. President. I have so many issues to bring before you. As a social activist, founder of Pundere, I was not able to come here today from, ba from Bangalore, Karnataka to Delhi because I was facing so much of financial crisis. Did not have money to travel here. I need to thank change.org for getting me here. Okay. The issue is, the two things I want to bring, one is the question, one is the request. The question is, when the state terror is against minorities, be it a transgender, be it a sexual minority, be it a class, caste, religious, race minority, when you are being stigmatized, you are being discriminated because nowhere of your reason, and the patriarchal notion and the power is dominating against you, and I want to take my strong objection on it. Right? Like the recent, like how do I speak? I'm a criminal before the section 377, which criminalizes because you are a transgender, lesbian, gay, bisexual, and how do I raise my voice against this? The second thing is about the Transgender Protection Rights Bill, where the government is not in a consultative, democratic, transparent way of discussing what exactly the community wants and not the government wants. If that's so, how do I raise my voice? How do I fight against it? That is my question to you. How do I resolve the world crisis? I think across the world, we as sexual minorities, as transgender, facing social dejection, you know, like negligent uh, way attitude. We are seeking for love, affection, acceptance. That is my question to you. How do I deal with that? My request. My request. My request. Can I hug you? That's it. Well, we can, we can have a hug after the event's over. The, uh, cause, cause, uh, otherwise, I'll start, uh, you know. Thank you. We'll, we'll, we'll be doing a lot of hugging, and I won't be answering any questions. Uh, but, you know, it, it, um, I, I can't speak to the specifics of legislation in, in India because uh, I'm not qualified. I have not been uh, keeping pace with exactly what's happening uh, in, in the parliament around these kinds of issues. Uh, but I can answer your, your more general question. Um, and, and I think the, the, the answer is, uh, it begins with what uh, you just did, which is to, to find your voice and to be able to, to articulate uh, your views and your experiences and tell your story. And that's true of, of, of uh, any group that is marginalized, stigmatized. Finding that voice uh, and being able to, to, to tell a story so that um, the perceptions that somehow you are different 
are broken down because people start recognizing their own experiences in you. They see your humanity, right? So, uh, you know, th this is one of the reasons, by the way, by the way, why art is often often a powerful tool in social change. Because what it does is, through art, suddenly people see for the first time, oh, that uh, black person feels like I feel. Or that woman is experiencing something that I should be able to understand. There's something we have in common. Or uh, that person of what has been considered an inferior caste. Turns out they have the same kinds of hopes and dreams that I have, right? That moment of recognition is the basis around which you begin to build political movements. Um, once you, that voice is there, hopefully others join you, right? And so now you have networks and organizations and allies. And one of the things that I think is important uh, in, in terms of any effort to, to bring about positive change is thinking about uh, the, the allies that you are, uh, that are available to you. Uh, your issue may be climate change, or your issue may be gender equality, or your issue may be uh, public health. But the question then sometimes is, can you find uh, the intersection between those issues. Is there a way, if you're working on public health, to engage with environmental activists because it may be that uh, improving air quality is a key public health issue, but it's also a key environmental issue. If you're a transgender person and you're seeking uh, you know, to, to be recognized and have full equality, well, you need to be speaking with women's groups generally who are concerned about sexual assault, right? And so forth and so on. So finding those alliances, I think, then become important. Um, and then, once that happens, it's a matter of applying political pressure and, uh, and, and being able to mobilize public opinion. Um, and that's going to take some time. It's what we just talked about earlier in terms of uh, how we can get uh, discouraged sometimes because progress does take some time. But you should take some measure of hope by just looking at what's happened um, in the United States and in a lot of other countries around uh, LGBT issues generally. I Again, I, I'd like to think I'm not that old, even though, you know, my, my hair is a little gray. Um, but Michelle thinks I'm still cute, she says. <laughs> but, but um, you know, you know what, when, when, I, when, I was in, when I was in college, so this would be back in uh, the early 80s, uh, it was just beginning uh, for uh, persons who were openly uh, gay or lesbian to have student organizations. Um, the laws on the books were still discriminatory across many states uh, in uh, in the United States. And so now the, there is a just an open uh, acknowledgement, even among many conservative parties, that we should not be discriminating against persons because of sexual orientation. And that happened, you know, with respect to human history, amazingly quickly. Right? In, the, in the span of, of 20 years, basically. Now, in the span of one person's lifetime, that can s seem painfully long. Um, but, uh, but it requires a steady education of the public. 
uh, and then a political strategy that uh, puts pressure on elected officials, and that's going to take some time. Uh, yes, sir, right here. Let's get a microphone. And then we'll go to an internet question, online question. Uh, so I'm Nipun Malhotra, I'm a disability rights activist, and I run the Nippan Foundation. Uh, you're spending a lot of your time post-presidency on mentoring young change makers. Yeah. What is the role of mentors in your life? You know, it's an interesting, it, it's an interesting question. I, um, I think part of the reason that I, I, I consider this very important, uh, the, the idea of, of mentoring, uh, is that in some ways I didn't have as many mentors as I probably would have liked when I was coming up. Um, my father left when I was very young, so I didn't know him. Um, my grandparents, my grandfather, my gra grandmother helped my mother raise me, and, and they gave me all kinds of love and support. But uh, and, and I had a stepfather uh, who I lived with for five years, uh, all, all of whom were very kind, good people. But uh, I can't say that I had somebody who took me under their wing and kind of groomed me. I, I had to kind of figure a lot of stuff out on my own, uh, which is part of the reason why I was parting for, from the age of 15 <laughs> to, to, to 20. Um, and and I, so I think it's, in, it's the absence uh, in some ways of mentors when I was young that makes me appreciate how valuable they were. Now, as I got older, I began to meet certain key people in my life who uh, I think gave me ideas, gave me direction. Um, but it wasn't very systematic. Uh, and w what I've discovered as I became more successful was that uh, my ability to have an impact on people uh, just by paying attention to them and giving them some advice and giving them some counsel and, and helping them learn from mistakes I had already made, uh, they found incredibly powerful. Uh, and I realized I would have also if I had had figures uh, like that in, in my life. Um, and, and so part of what we've done is we've, we've tried to systematize this. You know, when we were in the White House, Michelle and I both uh, would take on uh, mentees, uh, kids from underprivileged areas, and I'll, I'll use Michelle as, as an example actually because uh, I, what she did was wonderful. She, she would take a group of, let's say, 20 young women. These were all from poor s schools, uh, uh, mostly uh, African American and, and, uh, and Latino. And uh, you know, she would meet with them. She would like host a tea at the White House with them. She would take them to, to meet with college counselors to talk about how they could potentially get to school. All told, probably over the course of a year, if you added it all up, she probably didn't spend personally more than eight hours with them. But what she was also able to do then was assign somebody from her staff to each individual person to mentor them. And if you added it all up, those young women would say that it was one of the most powerful things that had ever happened to them and, and tr changed the trajectory of their life. But it, it was with a relatively small investment. So it goes back to the question earlier about technology, the power of technology, how you leverage it. Mentoring is similar in the sense that you can, you can leverage a few hours into something very powerful uh, that, that can give a, give a boost to a young person. Um, and, and all of you are in a position already if you're sitting here, that means you've already succeeded in doing some amazing things. You're already in a position to mentor somebody behind you uh, in a way that would be transformative for them. And it wouldn't take that much time. And so if you just then think about that, you multiply that, uh, uh, you know, the, the impact of that can be uh, profound uh, and, and powerful. Go ahead. All right, we have a question from um Tejesh was also in the room uh, with us right now, oh, and <laughs> Tejesh. Well, if, well yeah. if Tejesh is in the room, yeah, I'll call on him later. Let's go All to right. a next question for somebody who wasn't in the room. 
Tejas, you were kind of double dipping here. Huh? <laughs> It's sort of like, you sort of like, well, if I don't get called on here, I'll get my... It's a good strategy, but I caught you. So we have a question from Zen, um, and Zen asked this question on Facebook. What are the strategies for passing leadership to the upcoming younger generation for the betterment of our society? Well, we, we, we just talked about, uh, I, I think mentoring is, is, is uh, a good strategy. Um, one, one thing that's worth thinking about uh, some of you have probably already confronted this in your o own organizations. Some of you may be the heads of organizations and you're going to have to start thinking about this and dealing with it, is how do you empower young people uh, once they're involved in your organizations? Because um, let's take the example of political parties just for a second. You know, the, the work we're doing the foundation is nonpartisan, so I'm not referring to any specific political party. Um, but one of, the, one of the things that I see as I travel around the world is the political party is full of really old people <laughs> who've been there forever. And, um, and, and look, I, I'm a member of the Democratic Party in the United States. I'm a very proud member. But the truth is, is that we have a lot of leadership that's been there for like since I was a kid, <laughs> or at least in college. And two things result from that. One is it means that uh, young people who aspire to have influence get blocked. They, they have nowhere to go. The other thing is, is that over time, you, if, if, if you've, you've been a leader for too long in the same spot, you start losing touch. Right? I mean, you, you, you don't have a feel for what's happening because you get set in your ways and new things happen. Uh, and what is true for political parties are true for every organization. And, and one of the big advantages I had in 2008 when I ran was we, partly because we were underdogs, partly because of my previous experiences as an organizer, uh, our bias was to have young people come in and then we just give them huge amounts of responsibility. And, and we'd take some 23-year-old and we'd just throw them into uh, some community. And we'd say, you're now the director of this community and your job is to get us this many volunteers and this number of votes and go figure it out. And then, you know, they'd come back after a while and they'll say, you know, this is, I have no idea what I'm doing and it's not working and I'm, discouraged and I'm calling my mom and <laughs> wondering if I've made the right decision in my life and and then we'd work with them but what you'd find is is that over time as long as you had a certain tolerance for uh, errors but also as long as um, you 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 hired people and, and instilled with them the core values of, of what your organization was about, so you knew that they were gonna do things the right way and treat people with respect, and uh, you know, if they made a mistake, it wasn't a mistake of treating people badly or you know, uh, you know, somehow not encouraging other people, but they'd make mistakes that we all do especially when we haven't done things before. The, the bottom line, though, is, is that we ended up having so many more leaders with energy and new ideas. That's how our technology took off, was because we just gave responsibility to a bunch of young people and said, yeah, let's try this out. And, and things would happen that would not have happened if we were just hiring the same old people who had done the same old things the same way for years. So uh, what, that, what that means then is if you want to 
keep your organization fresh and engaged and attract young people into it, you can't uh, hold all the power yourself. You can't have a, just a complete top-down, here's your orders and you just, there has to be some element in which people are valued. Now that doesn't mean that, you know, I, I do want to say that sometimes um, in the United States at least, I don't know if, if this is true in India, uh, what are called millennials get a bad rap because maybe they have such a high estimation of themselves. <laughs> you know, so we joked, you know, we would get people coming in uh, to the White House, you know, young people, very talented, gone to great schools, they're very smart, and they would come in and um, they'd be like, you know, I, I think I should be helping the president with his speeches. <laughs> and I was like, well, I'm sure you're a very good writer, but right now what we really need you to do is uh, research this memo that you were assigned uh, and for which you are getting paid. <laughs> and then maybe s after you do that for three or four years, maybe you'll sit in a meeting on one of the speeches that the president and his speechwriters are working on because you actually know more than they do about the topic you were researching. Um, so, so this is, this is an argument to make, you know, to just uh, give people completely unrealistic expectations about what they can do, and, and people have to earn their stripes. They have to uh, uh, pay their dues. But, but what it, it does mean, though, is, is that don't sell people short, young people short, about what they can accomplish. Give them serious responsibilities. Care about the ideas that they have. Um, if they don't perform, explain why and how they can do better. Uh, and, and if you build that into the culture of your organizations, uh, then people will stay with you um, and, and, and will feel invested in it because they'll see themselves growing in the process. Okay, um, we've got, uh, I think it's a young woman's turn, so. Oh, that's very, that was a good strategy there for, <laughs> to, to distinguish yourselves. Uh, you guys are slick, all this, this group. This young lady right here in the, by the way, I call everybody young ladies, because I'm now at the point where. Which one was it? I was calling on the one in the black, but I feel guilty now that you stood up. So go ahead. Did I do it? Uh, well, is it the same question? <laughs> no, go ahead. <laughs> Uh, President Obama, it's wonderful uh, to be uh, able to meet you uh, here. Uh, my name is Nidhi Razdan. I work with a TV channel called NDTV. I've covered your meetings with Prime Minister Modi, with uh, Dr. Manmohan Singh as a reporter, and so it's nice to be here uh, to to just listen. Uh, my oh, question. You're a, you're a journalist. Yeah. <laughs> well, oh, you shouldn't. No, you don't get a chance to ask a question. <laughs> oh, hold on. No, no, sit down, sit down. No, 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 no. I mean. Uh, look, uh, you seem like a wonderful uh, journalist. Why don't you hear and the question first? And you seem first? very professional. You can hear the question first and then no, decide if you want to answer. No, no, no. You might because, like the question. Because the, the goal here was to have these young people, you should report on all the wonderful young people. I'm that doing are that here. too. Okay, come on. Give them a chance. Come on, you get, you get to, you, you're in front of a microphone all the time. No, no, no. Sit down. Uh, Why don't you hear this, the question this young first? Lady. This young, no, 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 I'm sorry. No. Come on. Good try, though. Oh, well, that's true. You know what? Are you a journalist, too? You sure? Okay, you get your question. Go ahead. Thank you. Thank you. Now, by the way, we need good journalists, and I'm so grateful that you're covering us. But you should interview these young people afterwards. They'll have more to say than I do. Go ahead. Sorry, Nidhi. <laughs> Well, President, I must actually tell you this. Uh, you're one of the finest dressed presidents oh. in the world. <laughs> great Thank suits. You. Great suits. Um, my question is really simple. Uh, my name is Malika Bajaj, and uh, we work with a lot of women um, in the rural, remote village areas of my country. And uh, what I need to understand is, so you picture a little girl with a lot of dreams, but no education. How does the Obama Foundation help 
people like us who are working um, to sort of take this forward and um, actually practically provide help because these dreams deserve a life. Well, I, I think uh, the, the kind of work you're doing is, is extraordinary and just, just to describe our goal for the foundation, uh, it's not to provide direct service ourselves because obviously we don't have the capacity to, to build out a staff that could tackle all the problems in India, in Kenya, and in uh, the United States. Our goal is to identify young leaders like yourself who are are providing services or doing direct work or civic education or whatever it is that you're interested in, uh, and then giving you tools. So um, let's say that you are setting up, you've already successfully set up some sort of education programs for these young women in, young women in rural areas. You've built up a model that really works. And your dream is, I want networks like this all across the country. Uh, well, what do you need to do that? Presumably you need more money. Uh, how are you going to raise that? You're going to need some sort of organizational strategy to build out what you're doing, perhaps state by state. Um, you're going to need uh, perhaps uh, a, a better media strategy and social uh, you know, uh, media strategy in order to publicize what you're doing. So our goal then would be to provide you with uh, whatever tools you need to help scale up, to help succeed. And our bet would be that if we can help you succeed on a program that's working well, uh, not only will you help those girls that you're providing direct services to, but now you're also developing a model that perhaps uh, activists in Tanzania can duplicate. And perhaps as we set up regional uh, leadership summits, uh, you are meeting with groups of people who are doing similar works to, uh, to you and you're building up a global network. And, and it, it expands in you know, ever-widening circles. Right? So, so that's, that's the approach that we're going to be trying to take. Um, and it's still in the early phases, but what we know is that uh, the, the power of network effects, the, the, the power of each of you not just doing the individual work you're doing in your communities or on your specific issues, but the power that you gain from now knowing each other and communicating and trading ideas and learning, uh, that creates a, a, a whole that is greater than the sum of its parts. Right? And, and, and that's what we want to do. Uh, that's the leverage, I think, that we can bring. OK? Um, all right, the, the, uh, the, the, the gentleman who sneakily put uh, his uh, card in, as well as uh, being in the audience. This better be a really good question. <laughs> I'm teasing. <laughs> Go ahead. My name is Tejish, I'm a developer. Uh, thank you for Chelsea Manning pardoning her. Uh, my question is, uh, how do you build consensus when you have parties which are opposing views? Uh, how do you reach out to people on the other side and how do you build consensus? Yeah. Uh, well, I, look, I, I think it, it's, a, it's a powerful question. It's, it's one that every society, every democracy is facing right now. Um, and it's not easy. I've, I've already indicated a couple of things that uh, I think would help. Uh, the first is just the very simple uh, but, but profound idea that you have to listen more than you speak. <laughs> right? I, I, I benefit from having big ears. So uh, my mother always used to tell me to, to use them. And, and I think that so often we, we have trouble even getting to compromise because we don't even s take the time to hear 
what the other person has to say. Um, it's harder to do these days, I think, in the political context because there's just so much noise and um, there's so much competing attention and there tends to be, what gets the most attention is conflict and sound bites and tweets and the more controversial, the better. And so as a consequence, there's no dialogue. It just en ends up being a constant contest across social media and, and the airwaves uh, for attention. Um, but each of you in your own areas, in your own fields, in your own work, there are probably people who are on the other side of whatever issue you're dealing with or at least aren't as responsive or don't seem as invested in the things that you care about. And you can reach them, right? So, so let's say you're in a village and you want to educate girls, but there's some social resistance because of certain traditions to providing the girls the edu education that they need. Rather than just try to scold the men of that village about, ah, you're backwards and you're patriarchal and blah, blah, blah. Sitting down with them and just finding, well, how do you think about these issues? Uh, yeah, and, and what do you hope for your own daughters? And do you think it's fair if some young woman who's really talented isn't getting an education? And, and, and actually trying to get a sense of what is it, what's the underlying ideas that they have. Now, ultimately they may be completely wrong. But just the mere act of you asking them what they think in a respectful way may at the margin soften things up a little bit that you now can get something going, right? Uh, and, 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 and that, I think, is, is just a basic exercise that, that not enough of us engage in because we tend to just want to win an argument, right? I, I mean, we, we're, we're trained especially a lot of young people like you, you're smart and, and you're, you're used to you know, being clever and competing in school and so, ah, you know, and you start arguing. And, and uh, this is the benefit, by the way, of uh, those of you who are not married. Once you get married, it may take you about 10 years to figure out that like winning the argument <laughs> does not necessarily result in good outcomes. <laughs> like there are a lot of times where I win the argument with Michelle but I lose the war <laughs> and, and then over time you realize you know what let, let me try to figure out how do how I just get things in a good place and, and that may mean that I didn't win the argument uh, but, but, th but that, that principle applies now look it, it, when you when uh, there are some structural issues that are difficult to handle. Um, and I alluded to some of them, the, the nature of social media and, and, and in the United States, I don't know what's comparable here in India, but in the United States it used to be when I was young and, and now I'm talking about when I was you know, 12, 13, 14 years old, uh, back in the 70s. You basically had three channels. So, Everybody watched three channels. Everybody basically watched the same TV and the same newscasts and the same documentaries. And so even though there were disagreements, everybody kind of was operating on the same basic facts. Now you've got 500 channels and you've got the internet and YouTube and Facebook and, and so there are a hundred versions of the truth, or a thousand, or a million. It becomes harder to compromise when there's so many different uh, versions of the truth and people aren't agreeing to the same facts. I used this example this morning. I can have a discussion with somebody who's, who says, okay, yeah, there's climate change, but it's more important uh, to alleviate 
poverty and get electricity to people, so we should use coal because it's cheaper. And then I can have an argument. I say, well, actually, solar is becoming cheaper, and if you, what I have trouble doing is having a conversation where somebody just says, the climate's not changing. <laughs> because then I have to, I, I mean, there's, there's just a lot of work. Uh, you know, it, that becomes almost like a, a, a theological argument. Uh, it's like, a, because it, it just has to do with uh, somebody's decided this is what I believe as opposed to looking at evidence and, and facts uh, and, 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 and the process of reasoning uh, that, uh, you know, signifies things like the scientific revolution. Um, so uh, that, that, I think, makes things harder, but this is part of the reason why I think it's so important not to just, not just to be a, an internet activist. Because I think that, that if all you're doing is communicating online, it is very hard to break across opinions, uh, or, or to reach in a serious way and engage people who don't agree with you. But if you're sitting face to face, and you're having a conversation, even if it's something just as subtle as you notice, oh, this person's wearing the, the, uh, a shirt with the logo of my favorite you know, football team. And maybe we can talk a little bit about you know, sports, which gives us something we haven't, right? Some possible areas of, of common experience that then leads you into the ability to, to have those, those conversations, all right? Uh, and, and then the, the last point I would make, though, about, about compromise, um, examine yourself so that you understand you, you can't be a purist if you want to actually make change. Because you will never, you will never get 100% of what you want. You will never get 100% justice, or 100% equality, or 100% clean air. And, and so, so you are, if you are living in the world trying to make change, then what you have to anticipate and embrace is the idea of incremental change, because that's generally how change works. That's how change works in nature, that's how change works in geology, and that's how change works in uh, human societies. Now, I always used to tell my staff, and, and by the way, uh, as president, uh, I was often attacked more vocally and more fiercely from the progressives who had voted for me then from the other side on some issues because their attitude was, ah, you didn't get this and you, why, why are we still waiting on that and this is taking too long and et cetera, et cetera. And it was okay, I, you know, I, I developed a thick skin. But what I would tell to my staff is our goal is to make things better. Better is always good. Better is not best, and you sh we should try to get as much as we can done in this area that we're trying to get done. But you know what? If, if, if we walk away with some better, take it. That's good. Because the, the idea is the next time, there will be more to work on. And, and you, know, you, you just continually move in the right direction. Huh? And, and your work will be unfinished. As young as you are now, at the end of your life, you know, all of you could end up being these amazing, you know, leaders of social movements and prime ministers and, and entrepreneurs. And at the end of your life, something's not going to be finished. Something will be incomplete because that's the nature of things, right? All right. Uh, where are we at? Am I on an internet question now? I think we can take an audience question. An audience question is yes. okay? All right. You, you said that authoritatively. That's good. <laughs> Uh, where was I? I, I? I guess I I just 
I answered your question, didn't I? So it's a, so it's a young lady's that's a, I have, I, I've been neglectful of this side of the room, haven't I? Or, or, or uh, yes, go ahead. You, you are waving anxiously. Yes, go ahead. Please. Thank you for your campaign, President Obama. I was a senior at Berkeley the night you were elected. Oh, is that right? <laughs> it was amazing. We took to the streets because we finally had a relatable president, someone of color with an immigrant history, constitutional law. So, I mean, it's, I'm, I'm like your number one fan. Yeah, that's great. <laughs> um, what are you doing now? Yes, so my name is Pranita Saxena, and I run an organization called Citizen Gage. We're a startup, and we're building the world's first waste-to-resource grid. And my question to what, you... What does that mean? Great. <laughs> so Very quickly. Sure. Executive summary. Sure. So 85% of India's waste can be recycled, but 90% is sitting in landfills. And this is the case, the U.S. landfill 67%. We don't have a way to connect different facilities that are biogas plants, energy producers, um, farms, recycling centers, paper mills, to someone's waste that is willing to keep it separated and then run it like a grid to you know, get it where it needs to go. Got it. So this is, of course, a technology platform, um, requires a lot of different things. My question to you is when we are building something like this, we have to work with governments and really difficult policies to be able to scale. So one of the biggest issues in India and other countries is that as a startup, you can't even qualify to tender. So what can the Obama Foundation do to help um, companies and startups working in you know, civic change on a systematic level? How can you perhaps provide risk capital or look at social impact bonds or what solutions do you have where we can actually scale um, and participate in, you know, innovating the governance of essential resources? Yeah, I, I think the, uh, that, that's an interesting question. Um, I think what is absolutely true is that there is a great interest right now in uh, how do we channel capital uh, into areas of great need um, and in some cases using a, a market-based or a for-profit model to bring about social change. Uh, so the, the whole movement of, of, of impact investing, uh, the interest in figuring out how do you leverage, for example, pension funds and other pools of capital to, to facilitate uh, you know, impactful change in the environment or in education or in other areas. Um, how, how do philanthropies think in ways that aren't just, all right, we're going to give money to a charity, but rather we're going to give money to organizations that are trying to build sustainable uh, models of self-help and income generation. Those are all uh, a, a bunch of questions that we're very interested in. Um, I don't have the specific answer for you right now uh, because I think that part of what we're going to be doing is, is gathering up information about what's already available and it may just be a function of us matching programs that are already developing with people who are looking for it. Um, when I was uh, president, we, alongside these young leaders programs that we started running, we also set up uh, these global entrepreneurship summits, uh, where we would. We just it just happened yesterday. Um, how'd it go? Were you there? I was there. Jamie Swan was incredible. Was it good? It was amazing. It's a good model. <laughs> Thanks, Obama. <laughs> it was good. So. I'm glad it's continuing. And uh, no, I actually knew that it was continuing. I just didn't know it was yesterday. Um, so, the, so, so what we know is that just the function of matching up organizations that could use capital and have a, a good business plan with capital that's out there is, is, is 
uh, is something we know how to do. Um, but uh, how, to, how the foundation operates optimally uh, to facilitate that, whether that's something we do in-house or whether that's rather something that we um, contract out or connect and partner with organizations that are uh, already doing it, that's something that we haven't yet made a determination about. Oh, how do you work? Yeah, and I mean, industries will be forced to take risks because the hedge money's already been put. So, 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 so you're talking about are there are there government regulations that are in place that are preventing exactly. some of this, in part because they're probably protecting existing industries, legacies, exactly. and so forth. And uh, well, that that just goes back to what we've been talking about the whole time. There, there's no magic formula for that. You got to apply enough pressure and build up enough allies to overcome the barriers that are preventing you from this new innovation. And that means that you probably have to do an analysis of, and I have no idea what the constraints that you may be facing right now are, but one good place to start, this is a very simple uh, sort of organizing one-on-one -on -one principle is, is doing something that we call a power analysis. So, so often people start, beca because they're well motivated and want to do good, immediately start charging in and confront all these things that are blocking and preventing them from getting done what they want done, and they never really bothered to step back and evaluate what's the environment in which I'm trying to get this done, right? So knowing nothing about what the constraints you have are or what governments, what levels you're dealing with or what have you, what I know is is that you could get a blackboard and some chalk and you could just start asking the questions, who makes decisions about X, Y, Z? What industries might be threatened by what you're doing? What are their ties to elected officials in that region? What industries or constituencies might benefit from what you're doing? Who are the leaders that have influence over those constituencies that you could connect with, right? So you just start mapping these things out. And how, hold, hold on a second. They, they, the, 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 uh, so, so before you uh, know how to overcome the pressure, you got to know where the pressure is coming from. You got to, you got to know the territory. Now I gather this young man who who just blurted something out. What he said was, "What, what about the pressure you face?" Well, yeah. I, I, look, look, the, the, the fact is that you will experience pushback if you want to try to change something. Somebody's benefiting from the status quo. That's why it's the status quo. Sometimes they're benefiting it, some, sometimes they're bene benefiting from it directly and, and they help design the status quo to benefit them. Sometimes it's just that they've adapted to the status quo. It may not be optimal to them, but they've adapted enough to it that now change feels disruptive and scary to them and they don't want to change it. And yes, they will resist. And, and, and depending on the issue and depending on the moment and depending on the country, that resistance may be violent. Sometimes that resistance is simply uh, economic. Sometimes that resistance is uh, regulatory or legislative. Sometimes the resistance is social. Yeah, if this was easy, we wouldn't have to have this workshop. We'd go get pizza and beer. <laughs> um, so, so yeah, yes, there, there, there will be resistance if you are trying to do something that is hard and worthwhile and important. Um, and what I'm suggesting, though, is, is that the, 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 the purpose of the analysis is to understand 
where the resistance is coming from, to understand the, the, the nature of the power of that resistance, to be able to understand what might counteract some of that resistance. It also means, though, remember what I said about uh, slicing things into bite-sized pieces? It also means that if you don't have the power to overcome all the resistance all at once, well, then don't go just headlong, because that's a recipe for being really discouraged. So figure out what's the piece that offers less resistance and more allies, and get that done first, which then builds on success, and then creates confidence. So this grid that you're trying to build, is it possible for you to pilot it in one small area where there's less resistance? Or there's one politician who is interested in getting it done in that area? And is there a constituency that, you know, where you can monetize what you're doing and it puts some money in some ordinary people's pockets? And once you prove that, then it will be easier to overcome the bigger resistance, right? And, and, and so those, that's the purpose of the analysis. It, and, and it doesn't mean that, by the way, just by virtue of drawing it up on a blackboard that the resistance goes away. <laughs> but what it does do is it helps you know what it is that you're getting yourself into, right? Before you charge up the hill. How much time do we have? Oh, I'm not sure it's lots of time. Is this one more question? Because I have to fly to Paris and I'm already 15 minutes over. I've been very, I've been having so much fun. Uh, Hold on a second. I just said, I just, uh, we, we just called on a young lady. So it's a gentleman's turn. Uh, no, we didn't start with the guys. Th this is the first, it was a young lady who we just started with. <laughs> you guys are always trying to hustle me. It's good though. It shows you're good at organizers. All right, I, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to take two more questions just because, uh, just because uh, I'd like you. So, uh, uh, but, but, it, but it's, a, it's a guy's turn. And, and so the ladies, put down your hands right now so that I can just uh, see who it is that I should be calling on. Uh, <laughs> you know, uh, I, I'm going to call on, 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 the guy, on the guy with the beard because I, I, it's a good beard. <laughs> I like it. So let, let's, let's, let's see what he has to say. Uh, Mr. President, good evening. Um, you know, I have to tell you that when you became president, I changed my Wi-Fi network to Obama is watching. Oh, wow. Just to get that dose of hope every morning, and that's, it still continues. That's great. But <laughs> I, uh, my name is Akash Sethi, and I run a, a non-profit called Quest Alliance, which works on dropout prevention, school dropout prevention, and oh. job readiness. That's great. Uh, the question is, you know, automation is coming and that's, you know, expected to take a lot of jobs away, especially at the, at the lowest rung. Mm. Uh, there are going to be probably new kinds of jobs that are created and uh, the skills that, that uh, our school system is really right. giving young people don't really, uh, they're not producing right. those kind of young people who have those skills. So right. what does it take to you know, change the school system to think differently. And uh, where pilots are working, like you, like you mentioned, mm -hmm. uh, the scaling up of those pilots really needs a stronger political partnership. Yeah. Uh, and, and how do we really enable that kind of a uh, movement and change? Well, th well it's, a, it's a great question. I, th I think your analysis is right. Um, you know, I, I, it's interesting, I was talking to both the Prime Minister and then had a short conversation with uh, the opposition leader and both of them talked about jobs and the concern about producing enough jobs for a very young Indian population. Um, in the United States, uh, there is a concern, even though the unemployment rate right now is low, thanks to some of the policies I put into place when I was president, <laughs> Um, but the, uh, 
but they're still concerned about the quality of jobs, temporary jobs, et cetera. Th this is a, a global challenge that we're going to be facing. Um, it's, a, it's a combination of globalization, automation. It is going to accelerate as a consequence of AI and digital processes that allow any job that uh, lends itself to repetition um, is, is probably going to be automated fairly quickly uh, and very efficiently. So you're right, the nature of, of work is going to change. Now, keep in mind that India is such a vast country and there's still so many needs that the capacity for India to continue to generate manufacturing jobs, you know, blue collar work, et cetera, will still be there because there's just so much to do. This is such a big market, potentially. Um, but what is also true is, is that as a percentage in every country, no matter uh, how advanced or, or underdeveloped, the percentage of jobs that are going to require what's between your ears as opposed to what you're doing with your hands is going to grow. And uh, are, you're right that the school systems that we generally have in the United States, in India, really date back to the, agri the transition between the agricultural age and the industrial age and don't uh, fit the demands of an economy uh, built uh, uh, on, on top of this rapid technological change. I, I, I think that uh, governments are going to be more and more responsive and will recognize this fact, but the challenge is going to be building models that, uh, that work and, and then facilitating the transition from the old system to the new because there will be resistance to, to those changes. Um, I, I'm a big supporter in the United States of teachers. I, I think teachers tend to be undervalued, underpaid. Uh, it is the s most important job that, that we have out there. Um, I'm also a big supporter of unions because I believe that workers being able to join together uh, to give themselves more leverage with their employers is important. Um, there are times where I've said to teachers unions, though, you've got to be in front of change as opposed to resisting change. Just because this is how things have been done uh, and you feel that it's a comfortable way to protect your members, you, know, you should be leading the charge in how do we redesign classrooms. But sometimes there's been resistance because the feeling is, ah, you know what, this is going to put more responsibilities on us or it less, lessens our security or maybe it renders our own skills obsolete. Um, and I just use that as one example of resistance that may arise out of the traditional systems. It goes back to the point I was making earlier, which is, I think, finding ways it, to prove concept in a redesigned school, and then starting to build allies and work outward, that's going to be the process by which this changes. Um, but it, it will probably be a generation uh, for these changes to take place, and it's going to be sporadic and spotty, and you need to anticipate that, um, particularly in a country as large as India. Okay? All right, last question. Yes. Uh, they, uh, no, 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 no begging or, or uh, because I, because, ev because everybody here is so appealing and, and has wonderful things to say. Uh, all right, you, right there, the, uh, with the glasses. Oh, but you know what, this is, this is, this, you, you are the, the, the one back there. Because, no, 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 right, well, I guess I, I, I have peep, three people with glasses in a row. <laughs> I'm sorry. Right there all the way in the corner. Right at the end. Last question. Uh, good evening, President. My name is uh, Pratiksha. I work as an organic farmer ah, um, in Rajasthan. Cool. What do you uh, grow? Um, all over India. What do you grow? Oh, what do I grow? Um, everything from grains to vegetables to... 
pretty much anything to kale, um, to everything. Yeah. Um, Why did you point uh, about kale? No, well, it's, it's really. <laughs> what is that? Do, well, I, do I look um, like a, a kale I guy? Or? <laughs> so. Actually, I do like kale. See? No, no, <laughs> kale's fine. Um, yeah, well, America made kale really popular, so we have to grow it now. Um, thank you so much for bringing us together here. Um, in the farming community, uh, you know, we joke that there are two kinds of farmers farmers who farm and farmers who talk. Uh, farmers who talk are the ones you see on the news channels, at conferences, um, and you know, farmers who farm feel like they, the, the farmers who talk while their job is also important, but they get so far removed from the challenges and the needs of our work mm. um, that they start misrepresenting us. Um, and um, you know, so in your experience, how should one divide their time between raising awareness for their cause and actually doing the, the work of the cause? Well, that's a really interesting question. Yeah, that's, a, that's a really good question. Um, you know, I, I think it's, it, it's going to be different for different people, right? Uh, because part, part of it depends on um, what stage of life you're in, what the nature of your work is, uh, are you in a moment in time in which your advocacy seems to be making the biggest difference? Uh, you know, going back to uh, Dr. King, you know, he, his, his, his training was as a minister. Uh, and as he became more active in the civil rights movement, he probably neglected his ministerial duties for his church. <laughs> But we're glad he did because, you know, there was a uh, a higher, better use for his talents than just being in a single church. Although that might have involved a sacrifice for him and his family. Uh, so, so I think that, that it's going to be different for, for different people. What I do agree with is that um, trying to stay rooted... In, in the work that is important to you uh, and the people that you claim to advocate for is absolutely vital um, for, for, for you to, to be effective. And as an advocate, uh, and, and you know, I experienced this even as, uh, even as president. One, one of the, the, the toughest things about being president was you were in this bubble. Uh, and the U.S. president is almost unique, uh, even among world leaders, in because of security concerns, uh, the, the way in which you are just bottled up. And you can't walk down the street. And, and now with selfies, I mean, even, you know, set aside concerns about Guns. I, I mean, I just you, you, I can't walk down the street about you know without everybody want to take a picture and and see I figure that so so um, so what I of, often found was is that um, I had to really work hard and be intentional just to just to be in a conversation with the people who it used to be I'd routinely sit in their living rooms or meet on a corner uh, or or invite to a a town hall meeting, now it was like hard to just have a, that conversation. And, um, and, and so if that was true, and my job was to be president, <laughs> but I still felt as if I had lost something by not having that, that touch in that field, then obviously if you're advocating on behalf of at organic farming and you're not doing any farming at all, then you're going to lose touch. So. Um, I, I don't think there's a formula here. I think being aware of the fact that um, if, if all you do is, is you're just a talking head, that over time you're going to lose touch with the thing that motivated you in the first place, I think that's a good place to start. Um, and I, but I also think that, that at, at the end of the day, part of what you have to measure then is what is satisfying to you. 
Um, where, where is it you, that you want to uh, best deploy your talents? Be, because, uh, and this is probably a good closing message to all of you. There are so many different ways to bring about change and to do good work and to uh, you know, help people. Uh, and I don't think any of you have to feel wedded to one single way of doing it. Um, you can be a business person primarily who then also is supporting good work and is mentoring somebody as well. You can be a full-time activist who is every single day beating on the doors of power to bring about change. You can be primarily a writer uh, who's working just to spread good ideas, but you're shy and you don't like being out front. Uh, you, you, you can be an extrovert and want to run for office uh, and be in front of the cameras and be a spokesperson uh, on behalf of a cause, right? There are just so many different ways that you can make a difference. And, and, and the key is to, for you to find what is right for you and, 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 and what feels, uh, feels as if not only are you having the most impact, but it is also uh, giving you a sense of strength and, and satisfaction. Um, and and, and if, 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 if each of us are finding that way of, of uh, you know, even if it's small measures of courage, those single steps, then over time, India is going to be better and the world's going to be better, and, uh, and I'm confident that's what's going to happen uh, because uh, there's been a remarkable group, and I've enjoyed the conversation. Any closing words uh, from you? Uh, no, I think uh, I would just like to say that it's been an honor for all of us to actually have this opportunity to ask you questions. So, <laughs> so thank you so much for your time. And I think what you've said today about uh, you know, taking, taking things forward and how we as a community need to come together. It really resonates with all of us. So thank you so much, President Obama. Thank you, everybody. Good luck.